federation of uh, within the ONS and some other issues, but the discussion more or less, you know, was um, not so very clear where it should go, and so unfortunately then after the meeting, Francis Miguel passed away, and we there was a silence for a couple of uh, months, and so we more or less re-established it in the uh, meeting in, I think it was in Nairobi, where uh, we said, okay, the Internet of Things remains an issue. It's unclear what it is, so it's a new subject, but it's worth to use the framework of the Internet Governance Forum to discuss Internet governance, um, uh, uh, Internet governance issues related to the Internet of Things. One of the main conclusions from the discussion in Nairobi was um, the Internet of Things is not separate from the Internet. There was a discussion before the Nairobi meeting whether we should separate the Internet into the Internet and then the Internet of Things and then the Internet of Something. And uh, we discussed this in um, various groups and the conclusion was even if the Internet of Things produces some special problems for privacy, security, and something else. So that there is no need to have neither special institutions nor special top-down drafted policies for the Internet of Things. It's just an application on top of the domain name system and even issues which probably would need some policies like the allocation of uh, IP numbers um, could follow the existing mechanisms. So uh, we had Jeff Houston in the room from um, APNIC and I asked him the question, you know, will uh, one of the IRRs allocate IP addresses uh, in a different way to service providers who offer services for the Internet of Things? And the answer was no. So that means you need IP addresses here, you have it, whether it's for objects or for ISPs or what else, no difference. So um, this is important to remember because in the years 2009, 10, 11, in particular groups in the European Union had the idea to create a body similar to ICANN for the domain name system for the Internet of Things. So I think this came to an end in the last IGF in Baku. We had a similar small discussion and we all concluded this is not needed. Uh, we organized a workshop uh, in early August, in, again in Leipzig. It's now the third Leipzig IoT workshop on Internet governance because, you know, that's the city where I'm at home and Sandra, the manager of the IoT Dynamic Coalition list, lives also there. So that means we said, okay, this is a, we had a small meeting of around 30 people and um, came to the conclusion that uh, while um, the policy dimension remains on the agenda, but in the middle of the discussion should be the opportunities, what we have for opportunities with this Internet of Things. And we also concluded that Internet of Things is discussed now in so many isolated circles the transportation community, the car community, the you know, some technical communities, some other business groups, civil society groups who have a lot of fear and all this, that the challenge is now to try to pull them out of the silos and to offer an opportunity to discuss this issue more or less in a multi-stakeholder environment. And in so far, the conclusion was, okay, we should continue with the discussion within the framework of the IGF because the IGF offers the best opportunity to have a multi-stakeholder discussion on it. I was recently in um, a conference in Washington, D.C., around 400, 500 people, mainly from the U.S., discussed the Internet of Things, but it was mainly business. So that means government people were there, but the government was at down at this time, so they could not speak officially. Uh, private sector, uh, the civil society was not represented, and the technical community is more or less disconnected from the business opportunities in the US, and this is bad. So, and our offer is here in the framework of the Internet uh, Governance Forum to provide an opportunity for this multi-stakeholder discussion on problems around the Internet of Things. Based on some achievements, we have 
um, you know, produced in the, in the discussion in the last four and five years. And uh, one of these results of the discussion, which I call achievements, is that um, was discussed also in the workshop yesterday, was that the first thing we should discuss here are the opportunities. Being aware that opportunities have always some risks in it. That means we should not ignore that risks uh, exist in the further deployment of Internet of Things services, but um, the opportunities should be discussed in the first place, taking into account that there are some risks. Second thing is, there is no need at, at the moment, at least in this very moment, to discuss, you know, top-down policies or new institutions. So, third conclusion from the workshop was, okay, there are some public policy issues which needs specific consideration, but uh, needs specific consideration in the context of the general internet governance debate. And we have identified four areas. One is privacy, one is security, one is competition, and one is consumer protection. So these are four public policy issues, but these are not specific issues for the Internet of Things, because we also agreed in a discussion that um, privacy protection is needed in the Internet of Things, in social networks, in search engines, that means in a lot of other applications. And it would be stupid to say, okay, we need special privacy regulations um, for search engines, for ISPs, for, for, for each of the applications. So this would make no sense. That means we have identified these four areas which are relevant for public policies, but we would put this into the broader context of Internet governance. And um, next to other smaller conclusions, the final conclusion was, okay, we have to base future discussions on facts and not on fears. So there's a lot of fear around the Internet of Things. People say, okay, uh, you know, the, the objects will more, will know more about me than any, than I myself. And then if somebody can go to all this data which are collected by the objects about me, then I will lose totally my privacy. I will lose the control uh, over myself. I have no self-determination anymore, the objects will, will uh, you know, determine what I have to do, and so there's a lot of speculation. Some of the speculations are real, others are irreal, but there are still a lot of speculations, and we have not yet the full knowledge about the facts, and so that means we should move towards a fact-based discussion and not a fears-based discussion, which could lead then also to fact-based policies and not to fear based policies. This is where we are. Um, the report from the Leipzig meeting is online, so you can find it on the website from the Dynamic Coalition. And um, the purpose of this meeting is here to discuss something, you know, what could be done in the next year. In the workshop, I call this the IoT Roadmap 2014, the IGF Roadmap for the IoT for the year 2014, and so we are open for proposals. So the, the very simple proposal uh, we have for the roadmap is two things. So we uh, invite you to make more use of the existing mailing list to start a discussion, whatever you want, in a IETF style. That means if you have an issue and you have a proposal, how to discuss this, then you feel free to put this on the website and we will try to help you to stimulate the debate and to get answers. And um, the second thing is then, then we should have another workshop uh, between the IGFs and what we propose is to do it in connection with the Eurodic meeting in Berlin, which is in June 2014. Um, it would be a half day or one day event, one day or two days before the Eurodic in Berlin. And um, is in, 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 in Germany, this will be an open meeting where everybody in the coalition can participate. So we had already three of these meetings, but this time what we do in Berlin because the Eurotic gives us a nice environment and some people who will go to the Eurotic and are interested in Internet of Things can do uh, two things uh, with one trip, which is uh, also uh, money-saving and um, time-saving. And then we would... Uh, 
start with the preparation for the next IGF. So that we have in the next IGF also um, a workshop and another meeting of the dynamic coalition. Uh, we certainly have to discuss also a little bit, and if you have any proposals or ideas, let us just know, the structure of the dynamic coalition. So far, it's very loose structure. So we have, uh, you know, we started with interim solutions, and we have still interim solutions. So that uh, Avri and me, we are the interim co-chairs. So uh, Sandra is the interim coordinator. And we have uh, we had an interim steering committee, which really never really worked, but we did some we produced some results. So it's very flexible. So and uh, everybody hates big bureaucracies. So it means we are not interested to produce big bureaucracies, but you know to make the whole process a little bit more sustainable and uh, also serious. It would be probably good if we could move forward in, in, in towards more uh, stable structure. So at the moment, it's still very unstable. Um, last year in Baku, we asked it, should we close the dynamic coalition or should we continue? The majority said, OK, let's give us another year. Now we are here in Bali. So, And my feeling from the discussion yesterday and the discussion I had also on the list is that the majority says, OK, it's worth to continue. So this will be not you know, a big, um, very big element in the Internet Governance Forum, but an important element. And uh, as long as it's um, an important element, we should continue to do it, even if we do not really know what will be the outcome in two or three years from now. But to have a continuation of the debate gives sense. Uh, this was my introductory remarks. Probably Avri can add as a... Yeah, uh, thanks. I'm, I've gotta, I gotta say that last year when I became interim co-chair, I was one of those that said kill the group. And my reward for saying kill the group was to become his interim co-chair. So we had a balance between someone who thought there was no reason to continue and someone who thought there was a reason to continue. Um, and, and I really continued in that frame of mind until yesterday. And it was listening to a discussion yesterday, and I hate to say it, but it was listening to people up on stage using the arguments I had used for the last couple of years that convinced me that I was wrong. Um, and sometimes you really have to hear people saying what you've been saying before it comes back to you and go, oh, wait a second. And, and the thing that occurred to me yesterday which I, I confess to having been rather slow to come to it, is that by saying it is just what we've got now, that it is just internet, that it is just addressing, that it is just names, misses, I think, the point of there is a complexity that this adds to the network. And while indeed it does start as just the internet as we know it, being applied to objects that, that humans only deal with but not actually you know, uh, interact with to, to a certain extent, although there is interaction, that we miss the point of looking at sort of the, the, the long-term trends of what, if any, and, and, and I'll still admit that, that it's certainly not certain, but what, if any, does the complexity that this adds, what kind of effect does that have? Does it have an effect? And is that effect something that needs to be taken into account early enough in the process? Do we need to prepare for any possible, um, any possible effects of, of the complexity? I mean, one of the things that, that, that you know, I was toying with, and, and it was a sillyism, but I was thinking that the Internet of Things makes our current view of big data teeny tiny data. And that that, that explosion, we're, we're only now beginning to be at the, at the, the dawn of the age of big data. And, and I think that, that Internet of Things 
pushes that boundary to, to places I certainly don't understand yet. So in terms of the dynamic coalition, it would be looking at are there any governance effects, whether it's extra privacy, whether it's greater uh, you know, effects on the governance, not that it calls for a completely new form of internet governance, but I've come to think that perhaps it does put stresses on our governance system, internet governance system, that we haven't thought through yet. So, so that's when I started to shift from there's nothing to be done here and we should just give up on it to coming to a realization that maybe there is something to be looked at. And, and it is a notion of how does the internet of things play into complexity theory or how does complexity theory play into internet of things and how does that affect internet governance if at all. And so that's a question I've started to ask and wondered whether, in fact, the dynamic coalition has something that it can do, has, you know, carrying on with more conferences or going beyond just the conferences and actually thinking and working on that. Other than that, the only thing I do is add people's names to the mailing list. Okay. Go ahead. Ian Fish, BCS. Uh, one of the reasons I was on the yes side in Baku for keeping the dynamic coalition, well, there were three reasons, really. One of them average just stated. Another is another, another effect of complexity is the possible uh, emergent properties that will come out of a system which actuates and reactuates and more and more actuates things which don't actually have human intervention and there may well be unexpected emergent properties which need to be thought about and the third is the it was mentioned yesterday as well was the um, the business model issue because privacy for example relies a lot on security, it's, it's not the same thing, but it, it relies on it in certain ways uh, in these systems. And it was pointed out yesterday that the business case for uh, connecting things to the internet relies on doing it and leaving them alone for 15 years and not doing anything about it. Uh, we all know how quickly the cyber security world changes and how much you have to update. And that may be a problem which needs to be dealt with. Thank you. We do not have really formal procedures for this, so everybody can uh, make a comment or an intervention. But I think the purpose of this meeting is really to discuss what we should do in the coming year um, based on the more or less common understanding or the consensus that we should have an IoT workshop and a dynamic coalition meeting next year 2014. So I think this would be the final point in the roadmap to have the workshop next year. But uh, what we do bet between here and now? Peter Dengat Thrash, let me ask a formal question then because I'm not familiar with the rules of the, of the IGF. Because to me, it seems there isn't anything to talk about. We, we agreed yesterday that there aren't any issues and points that you made, uh, and people have got some spec. You talked about fears, but we're not f afraid of anything in particular. Um, so what does the IGF require by, in terms of level of requirement, level of activity, if we just want to sit around and speculate about what might happen in the future and you need a d dynamic coalition to have a speculation session, then that's fine. But if there's actual topics, actual work to do, then this doesn't, we don't seem to have any around this. So, I mean, I, I guess that's what I'm looking for. We've agreed that we don't know what it is. We, there is no definition of Internet of Things. The European initiative that started it has died. Um, it's not any different from the Internet of anything else. We went through all these sorts of points yesterday, and we seem to be sort of struggling to find a reason to exist. So what's the minimum threshold requirement for a dynamic coalition to exist? And if it's just looking for things to think about and looking for things to talk about, then you could have a dynamic coalition on anything. So does this meet the threshold requirements? Um, first of all, I would contend that, that, that you're claiming decisions that weren't made. You were claiming uh, places we got to. Certainly there were some of you that, that, that say exactly what you say, but I think there were other people in the room that said no. And I don't think it's fears, I don't think it therefore can be ascribed almost to FUD as you were almost directing us to, but I think there's a real realization that there is complexity there that we don't understand. Now, 
the fact that you don't understand something but can see that it's there. We can see that there is a complexity problem. We don't fully understand it. Some people deny that there's a complexity issue, yet I, I would argue that, that that is patently not true because there is obvious complexity. We're already seeing effects. Um, so to be a dynamic coalition actually has a very low threshold. It means there's a bunch of people that want to talk about something, and it means that you do something, that you have meetings, you have conferences, you publish papers, you publish reports on them, which is about the, the threshold. It, it's a place where people who think there is an issue explore that issue. So, so I think if we've got people that says there are complexity issues, there are emerging property issues that we don't understand yet, we can deny that they're there, but, but some people denying they're there and some people believing they're there means that we do have something to discuss. So I think yesterday did not take us to the point of saying there's nothing, but took us to a point of saying we have a disagreement on whether there is something there or not and whether it affects the governance. But I think something that is also just in the real last year started taking off to the point where we're really starting to see more things. We're starting to see Cisco's world of things start to explode. That we're really just now at the dawn of the age of the Internet of Things. I think when you say we don't have a definition for it, I, I think that's true, but I think an issue, a, a, a definition is emerging. And so actually, given that this is a term that is being used, it's a term that an immense amount of money and effort is being put into, then I think it's something that definitely merits being understood. Now, if we spend a year or two studying the implications and get to your point and sort of say, nope, you know, those who said there was nothing here in the complexity and in the emergent properties were right, then indeed there is nothing. But, but at this point, I think there is a sufficient amount of concern that, that it meets at least a minimal threshold. Okay, well, can you articulate what that concern is and say how you, I mean, I, I, tell me what the concern is and how would you frame that into, a, into perhaps a question that could go away and be researched? I mean, that, if there's a very low threshold and it is just, just discussion, that's all that's required, then, then I'm fine. So what is the concern? How can you frame that as an issue that then we can direct attention to and put research into and come back and report on, for example? I think that's really a good topic for this particular meeting now and to see whether, I mean, I have my own notions. I think they've already been sort of put on the table that sort of says there's a complexity here and there's a complexity in growth and, and he's added the emergent properties that we don't understand. But going beyond that, people can add. Okay. Um, uh, with Avri, uh, um, I must say your conclusion of yesterday was not mine. Uh, so. And I admit there was no official conclusion drawn, uh, nor is there a report on that meeting that has been handed out. But nevertheless, for me, it was very clear that there was a general uh, realization that uh, all these things on the internet, uh, collecting data, storing data uh, at all kind of places, I think the cloud was mentioned as, where you see the cloud problematic comes in as well, uh, and even more so, the more uh, sensors there are on the internet and the more data is stored on uh, places that people don't control. Uh, and the other point that came out is also that actuators, uh, things are going to do things without intervention of people, partly based on, on, on how they're programmed and partly based on uh, the, 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 the science, the, 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 how do you call it in, in English, the, the incentives they get. The, the 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 smells, the sounds, the the things. So realizing that it's going to go bigger, uh, realizing that it's part of the internet and it's going to co-determine how the internet will look like in the future, um, and realizing that uh, with going bigger, it will express in particular, and uh, we were particular about it, uh, big data, uh, who is responsible, uh, and uh, elements like that. I think it's very relevant to consider those factors and say what they mean for the rest of the world without having to resolve the rest of the world within that meeting. 
but leave that to the IP lawyers, leave that to the security people, leave that to the, the, the those who build clouds and things like that. Okay, thank you. Go ahead. Thank you. My name is Amelia Andersdotter. I'm a member of the European Parliament for the Pirate Party. And so um, I didn't work with the Internet of Things much, but uh, if I understand this concept correctly, something like smart meters in electricity grids would, for instance, be an integral part of this system. And so in Sweden, we took to mind the advancements of technologies, and we have actually 4.5 million smart meters deployed in all the households and in most of our major industries, in the hospitals and critical infrastructures, only they are internet connected and therefore also vulnerable to all of the risks and dangers that can be observed in the general internet sphere, where we now also have increasing military activity from a lot of governments that are promising to invest high amounts of money in cyber offensive capacities. And so that's a bit of a problem actually, that uh, the entire Swedish grid can be shut off remotely. And my government realized that it is a problem when the electricity grid can be shut down by anyone on the internet. Uh, and so they started a crisis group and then they let the National Security Agency of Sweden start monitoring traffic in and out of smart meters so that we can detect attacks against the system after they have happened because it's very difficult to prevent attacks on a network. And so it strikes me that putting utilities um, on the internet, being a two-way communication space, um, can actually have a lot of problems affiliated with it. Um, um, this has been an issue that I've been thinking about also in the context of uh, the e-call system, which is a system for cars that the European Commission wants to make mandatory in the entire European Union. We have a lot of electronic um, devices being deployed in automobiles now, and mostly they are being deployed for safety reasons to help the generic citizen, as it were, have a more safe environment to be in. But as soon as you make it remotely accessible by other actors, even though that can create service functionalities for the vast majority of people, you also create specific risks for specific vehicles at specific times. And so um, most people will agree that some vehicles, if they are damaged or the person inside them are killed, that will have a much larger impact on society than if anyone in general is killed. So for instance, the Lady Diana car crash was much more traumatic for the world than uh, most traffic accidents that happen on a Friday evening. Um, and so we are creating really a perfect setup maybe for these types of specific risks. And we're also creating a necessity for there to be some black box agency keeping control over our utilities. And maybe we should think about whether the internet is indeed the optimal tool um, to solve some of the challenges that we're facing in utilities or in automobiles. Or maybe it's that the internet is a good tool for uh, a lot of other things that aren't utilities and that we should question whether we're really just being enthusiastic about gadgets and if that's the best policy road to go ahead. And so I would like to hear the other um, panelists' views on that phrasing. Thank you. I'm very thankful for this um, intervention because it shows that the things are getting, going very concrete. And what we also discovered in the yesterday workshop, there is no one-size-fits-all solution. You have to go case by case. And in particular, you know, the car example you mentioned, so I mentioned it also yesterday. That the car is on the one hand a driving computer now, but it can be subdivided in various parts. Probably the entertainment element in the car is low risk, the engine element of the car is high risk. So that means probably you have to have separations. That's why you have to go to all this on a case by case, application by application basis to find the right framework, the right solutions for this. And the best thing to do this is um, in a discussion process and uh, by starting to write some issue papers on that. And I think this is what the Dynamic Coalition could be, that we invite volunteers just to write a one or two page paper with you know, very condensed information which would help the broader community to understand the issues better so that we get the various perspectives from various stakeholders and the um, dynamic coalition could function like a clearinghouse. I think this is what the IGF is about, it's a clearinghouse, you know, to find out what's going on, who does what, what we can do. So we are not yet here that we can say, what we should do, so we have not yet the full picture, so we are still there that we say, okay, what's going on, and you know, who does what? So, and the next step would be then to come up with probably recommendations. I would say 
next year and two years from now. So that means the function of the dynamic collision is really, you know, that's why it's good to have a low threshold that it can, it's free to, to determine what it does as long as it does something which is useful and accepted by the community. And I see the room is rather fully packed. We have 70, nearly 70 people in the room. So that means there's a certain acceptance that it's worth to discuss the issue and to, that the dynamic collision could function like a clearinghouse. Hossein, uh, you are next. Yes. Can I speak? Yeah, this is... Uh, uh, okay. <laughs> Thank you very much for the opportunity. Um, I participated yesterday's session. I think I agree with what was quite an interesting session, and uh, the points of view were diverse, which it makes the discussion even better. Uh, I think moving uh, moving forward, um, uh, my point of view is Internet of Things is is a reality, um, and the experiences are starting to to, to happen. Um, moving forward, I think we start we need to, to aggregate these experiences. We need to hear about case studies, uh, experiences, positive and negative uh, risks and accomplishments um, in different sectors of, of the economy. Transportation, particularly cars, is mentioned rigorously, but this is not the whole the only thing. Uh, trans smart, smart meters is uh, mentioned again rigorously. It's very important, it's very useful, but it's also not the whole thing. And we need to look outside transportation to agriculture. Um, health, medicine, and, other, and uh, not only in the developed part of, of the world, but also in developing countries. I know yesterday in one of the winning projects was an agriculture-related experiment or project from, from India. I think this is very important for us to see how these are actually utilized in developing countries to resolve, as I mentioned yesterday, actual problems with, with economic, direct economic impact. This one will make people believe more in the importance of intents of things and come up with solutions to the problems that we will face. Certain issues of privacy, um, uh, big data, personal information, um, this will have to be addressed. There was an example again uh, the day before yesterday from Porto, from Portugal. And there is a smart city center in Porto City, I understand. And he talked about, again, about transportation and uh, uh, buses and taxis and so on, and that the unit on the, on the vehicle does not feed all the information to, to, to the network but has smartness to keep some information, and a small part of that is, is uh, uses a 3G or Wi-Fi network to, to upload to the central point of, um, of control. So this kind of, of understanding is quite helpful. If somebody did the experiment and has gathered experience, it's very important for us, for the rest of the community to understand this, to benefit from it, and do something more advanced in the next place. And what happens in Europe does not mean it has happened exactly the same way in, in the third world or in, in uh, Egypt or in India or somewhere else. There is a fine tuning process there. But learning from experience, I think that's what the coalition can do very, very well. And we are now at the phase where we have this kind of experience uh, starting to, to, uh, to creep out, but does not, have the forum, does not have a forum to be represented in. And I think the coalition can do this very well. And I agree with you on the point of having two paper write up. Um, Based on experience, such experience, if you can summarize in a two-paper document, it would be very useful, or a threat or a challenge. All this can be very useful to, to circulate. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, very good evening. And this is Are Magwal from uh, Department of Telecom, Government of India. I want to share some of the experiences which uh, India is doing in case of machine-to-machine um, -machine communications. Basically, as a part of National Telecom Policy 2012, machine-to-machine uh, -machine communication and its implementation was given a due importance by the government of India. Accordingly, um, we are in the process of formulation machine-to-machine uh, -machine, um, uh, policy in the country. And I want to share some of the few things uh, which we have received, uh, some inputs from different stakeholders. Basically, we have prepared around 25 questions with the consultation of uh, industry and other important stakeholders, including government, uh, different, different sectors of the economy. And then we have sent these questionnaires to more than 1,000 stakeholders uh, in the country, as well as uh, to different, different uh, important persons in the world. And uh, some of the very important inputs we have received, and we have um, uh, 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 seized some of the issues which I would like to share with you, so that at least it may be important for some of the countries. So first of all, first issue is number first issue is the bring uh, standards for M2M in the um, in line with the global standards. That is the first most issue.
issue. First of all, we should have some standards in line with the global standards. The second one is the allocating spectrum for M2M um, local area networks layer. So basically, against this, we have received so many um, options because M2M have different different applications. One size does not fit all, as already conveyed. So we will be needing uh, different requirement of spectrum from different different applications. So we should have uh, that thing um, while while uh, having some policy on, for, for spectrum location on M2M issues devices. And of course, uh, because uh, current uh, um, mobile number scheme will not work for M2M uh, uh, devices, so we need to revisit our national numbering schemes for the no mobile number. Similar may be the case for other, other countries also. also. And of course, um, okay, uh, always on requirement uh, may be there. So it, it is a big uh, uh, bandwidth and data requirement. Accordingly, it has to be uh, revisited. And of course, uh, this... Uh, uh, Inter-operator roaming and uh, inter-networks uh, mobility devices have to move from one country to another country. So jurisdiction issues may be there. So all the countries need to talk together. In case if we do work in silos, in isolations, so that won't be that won't uh, successful case. So I think this is a very right forum where uh, all the government must come together and must decide key the common point so that uh, issues may be resolved and of course uh, as yesterday i also pointed out key we need to do it fast because all the vendors are doing it very fast and in case if we do it after three years four years time then so much uh, water would have flown in the river so that may be an issue later on and uh, guidelines uh, for the bundled services that was also the point and of course ensure interoperability among the different uh, uh, service providers and the different uh, devices and um, address privacy and data protection norms is already pointed out by some of the um, persons in the uh, and of course this address kyc norms and customer traceability issues. Right now, Department, uh, Government of India has uh, uh, come out with some guidelines. Those exist, those are applicable to the individuals. So once these SIM cards are issued to the devices, so what will what would be the norms for the KYC for those devices and what are the traceability norms against those things? And of course, uh, this address security and lawful interception for machine-to-machine uh, -machine communications. And um, of course, to have policy around the customer, uh, uh, customer ethical issues. So we, these are the m uh, major issues which uh, uh, we have taken from the replies received from different stakeholders, and we are working on these things. So I understand through this forum, uh, some of the issues uh, may be resolved, which are applicable uh, to the um, other countries also. And so that uh, until and unless all the common issues pertaining to different countries are tackled uh, in a time-bound manner, so it may uh, pose a challenge to all of us. Thank you. Thank you very much. By the way, this brings me to the idea how we can enhance the collaboration within the Dynamic Coalition. If we use the email list or a website that we could put material, uh, articles or whatever, what we have collected in our countries uh, on this Dynamic Coalition website, so that we just, um, you know, share experience information on a national level. I think a lot of things is, uh, also research is already done in various countries, but it's not so known. So that means, uh, for instance, the European Commission has started a similar questionnaire uh, one and a half year ago has produced an interesting result, but unnoticed uh, in the broader world. But we can learn from each other, and uh, we are on the early stage here, and it always starts with communication, so that you communicate to each other and share information, and then you can go the next step and to say, do we need some action or coordination or whatever, and then you come up with some more concrete policy-oriented results. So we are not yet here, and in so far I encourage everybody also, you know, to go to the website uh, to, con to give your uh, business card to Sandra, and then uh, let's use the last minutes of this um, meeting here to discuss how we can do the internal business things, you know, within this dynamic coalition. Uh, you have asked for the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much. My name is Satish Babu from India. Uh, I think uh, there are already standards bodies in this uh, domain uh, from ITU and IEEE and so on. So the technical aspects, I am not very sure whether this is the right forum to 
address those things, standards and so on. But the point is that there is a development component to Internet of Things. Uh, and these are not all controversial uh, kind of applications. There are also non-controversial, like, as has been pointed out, agriculture, disaster management, and a bunch of other things. So uh, I am in broad agreement with what was proposed by you earlier, that uh, uh, the Internet of uh, our, our dynamic collation should not be, should be kind of, the threshold should be fairly low. We should be starting up with very uh, simple things first and then build on it. And I certainly see a, a room for uh, a kind of uh, orientation that IGF provides, the kind of broad stakeholdings that uh, are there here, which is not there for any of the technical IT, uh, IEEE or ITU, whatever, that we only we can provide. Therefore, I distinctly see a room for a dynamic collation on the, on the kind of lines of what you proposed. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think my uh, opinion is quite extends to the opinion of the ge uh, Indian gentleman over there. Uh, can you introduce yourself? Oh, sorry. My name is Hongi Cha from South Korea, and I, w I work at a research institute called ETRI. Um, <coughs> I think IoT, the concept, it exists already. So, for example, uh, well, everyone all know Samsung, LG. It's a little bit famous companies, and they produce TVs and refrigerators which can actually communicate with our smart devices, and even we can access to internet with those devices. So I think they already have their own IP addresses. So those kind of technical things are done by other technical um, committees such as um, ITUs and JTC1s and such like that. So what IAGF really should do is that I suggest that we um, at first analyze what those existing standards are. Uh, it's because uh, without those technical things, it's really difficult for us to understand what we should really talk about. And the reason why I'm talking with this is that um, I think IGF can really address the safety issues of Internet of Things because I remember yesterday some gentle, uh, a gentleman mentioned that suppose uh, some hacker intrudes to your, suppose your car and you cannot drive your car by yourself, then that can be a very serious problem. So that is a, that directly uh, relates to security problems. So I think IGF can resolve or find some good ways to solve how to protect users in terms of IT, uh, IoT. And in addition, if possible, I would like to um, suggest um, to make on terms of reference, if possible, because uh, I'm sorry, if there is already a terms of reference, then it's okay, but I couldn't find the terms of reference of the dynamic coalition of this group, and it was quite difficult for me to um, actually make up my mind to participate in this group. And I think this group is very interesting because I'm from the technical uh, side, and I think this group can actually really do to protect the future users of IoT. But the easiest way for every one to access this information is to make a terms of reference. So how about um, the, what do you call that? Um, the members of this dynamic coalition can um, produce a terms of reference. Yes. Thank you. Who else? Okay, there is no need that we fill all the 90 minutes for this. I think, um, I think it's clear, my conclusion from the debate so far is, yes, we should continue with the dynamic coalition. Yes, we should start thinking in doing some concrete work, and what I have heard is write some issue papers, share national experiences via the website, and prepare a workshop in between, and prepare another workshop and an agenda for the 2014 IGF, which is probably in Istanbul. And if this is an agreement, then we have more or less the main elements of the roadmap for 2014. There is no need to pack too many things into this train, which is still a small train, which goes with a slow speed. 
into uncharted territory. But what we need is also, you know, to have more volunteers who would uh, be more engaged in this. So far, and we have to apologize for this, um, you know, we are just the small volunteers and saying, okay, we are doing things which we think is needed, but uh, there are no resources and nothing really behind it. That means if we have some volunteers here, you would say, okay, I see this as an opportunity for me, or for my country, or for my company, or for my civil society group, and we could form, let's say, a small, small uh, group of engaged volunteers, a group of five or six, so that we can distribute certain responsibilities that we have something like, I would still call it interim, an interim steering committee, uh, so that we could work a little bit more uh, seriously on the website and the mailing list and the preparation of the forthcoming two meetings and the issue papers. This would be wonderful. So my question goes to you. Do we have volunteers in the room? One, two, Okay. Three, four. So that means more? And Rafik. And Rafik, five. The names. So could you communicate, or could you give your details to Sandra? So that means uh, anybody else, because then we, I would ask for something like rough consensus in the room, but so you agree that this is the steering committee for the dynamic, the interim steering committee for the dynamic coalition for the year 2014. And if, a question also I want to make sure before people leave, if you do want to keep track of this and want to be on the mailing list, do let me know. Yeah. Okay. So, well, thank you. I would like to participate, but I'm not quite sure yet because I need to ask my boss to be very frank. Okay. <laughs> yes. Then you are an, uh, an, an interim, interim member of the steering committee. <laughs> so we're waiting for confirmation, so it's pending. Um, and so that means the small group would then communicate about, you know, uh, website and mailing list. These are the two practical things we have to do. And then we would announce rather early the agenda for the workshop in Berlin, which is in June, in seven weeks from now. Uh, it will be a one-day workshop. Sorry? Seven months in June. Weeks. You, you in, seven, in seven months from now. And uh, then we could start with the preparation uh, probably in summer for the um, workshop uh, shop in, in Istanbul. Martin. Yeah, just one suggestion for the, the interim committee or the interim interim committee is to, to uh, come with a draft terms of reference yeah. to the group rather early. Yeah. So uh, that gives us a better ground for moving ahead in a direction we understand together. Yeah, I think that that's a good idea. That was a good suggestion. So that would be a really good thing to do first. Now, are we staying on this interim committee or are we leaving it and leaving it to these guys? No, we're staying on it? Okay, okay. Just wanted to check because, you know, we're interim, so the interim could have ended. I'm always looking for my interims to end. You know, there's nothing so permanent as a temporary solution. Uh, right. Okay, I just wanted to make sure, yeah. We're stuck. So um, anything else anyone would like to add? The, you know, the point the lady from Sweden made. Yeah, she's sorry. Gone, yeah. Yeah. Oh, there you are. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. So, you know, I want to come back to the point uh, made by the lady from Sweden, because while governments are not focusing as much on this aspect yet, but it's only a matter of time or one or two incidents where the security of the Internet of Things will attract a lot of government attention and uh, probably, you know, the IGF, I don't see my, uh, whether the IGF actually focuses on security-related matters. I see a lot of discussion on cybercrime and stuff like that, but uh, I know at the ITU they are not doing it. ITU is more about standards and... Uh, so, in terms of policy, uh, because in the Internet of Things, like you have the OTT, uh, you know, which uh, runs across uh, networks, and if you have legal intercept and, you know, you uh, want to control things or uh, get down to the bottom of things, 
how will it be handled? So I really uh, hope that we add her point into the terms of reference. Yeah, okay. I think that's good. I think um, it'll be interesting to see because the, the IETF, when it meets in Vancouver in two weeks, is actually starting to explore many of the privacy issues. I don't know if Internet of Things is one of the ones they're going to explore, but I'm going to be at that meeting and I'll explore whether it is being explored and get back to this group to see if there is something that, that pertains. So I can certainly report back to the group on whether the IETF is picking it up. Yes, maybe. Okay. Uh, that's one of the three uh, items, security side, that I brought up, and uh, uh, there are obviously more, it's just three that came to mind. And uh, uh, I would be following that up anyway as a matter of course, so within the committee, so, or the, the steering, whatever it's called, interim something. <laughs> Thanks. Can I make an additional point on that? So I think the problem is not only with privacy. So the smart meter problem in Sweden, of course, is that if we allow for the network, for the um, National Security Agency to monitor all the traffic in and out of these meters, because we're dead scared of, of uh, one of them being shut off remotely, which is at a hospital or so, um, that has clear privacy implications because they also can find out everything that all the private households are doing in Sweden. But then you have the um, additional issue of actually a lot of governments aren't only doing uh, passive monitoring, but we see a lot of investment in cyber offensive capabilities. Uh, while we're putting the utilities online. And so it's, it's very clear that households in a normal, stable country need water and gas and, and electricity and all of these things. And so putting those devices at all, uh, internet connected, has some um, um, implications that are very bad for the stability of a society I would guess, um, not because they're merely privacy invasive, but also because you're actually making them, them vulnerable to um, specific attacks from the outside. The internet is a big place. We talk a lot about how there's two billion people there. We want to put all of the six billion people on the planet on the internet. And so there are some types of systems, I guess, where we could question if we need them exposed to the attention of six billion people. I, and I think uh, utilities clearly are um, places where we want a larger reliability than can be granted actually by um, the internet, actually the internet. Absolutely, you're absolutely right. By the way, I didn't see that you volunteered to join the interim steering committee. Would you be ready to join? Because you have good arguments that this would be extremely helpful to have you in this small group to draft the agenda for the year, for the next. So it's just for, a commitment is just for, for one year. Can I get back to you? Okay, thank you. Just, I don't want to be nasty, but I doubt that the meters are designed so that you actually can close down the connection by the, by the signaling through the meters. They, if that's the case, it's a real bad design. We have 4. We have 4.5 million of them in Sweden and a crisis group in the government formed to deal specifically with that problem. I know that it sounds strange. Nevertheless, we find ourselves in this situation and this was a feature. It was not a bug. It was a feature. Sometimes called a misfeature. Okay, this is well, fact well, and fears, you know, this is fact and fears, so let's move, you know, forward to clarify what the facts are and uh, whether the fear is justified or not justified. I think it's a very good point that, uh, that you brought, uh, whether you join the interim, interim committee or not, uh, but uh, it seems to be a nice subject for this uh, terms of reference, something like do we need a taxonomy for what can be online and what can't be? Just a suggestion. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, um, there's no need to fill the 90 minutes. I think it was a very constructive, very condensed meeting. Um, I thank everybody. I thank the outgoing interim committee and I welcome the incoming interim committee and I declare this meeting closed. Thank you.